Good morning, everyone. Well, we have started a new series here at Faith on the names of God. And this morning, we're going to be looking at the name of Jehovah Nisi. Now, when I found out that I was going to be speaking on Nisi, I knew that Jehovah Nisi meant the Lord is my banner. And I've heard messages preached before on the fact that God is our victory banner, and uh, appropriately so, because he is. And so therefore, with that in the back of my mind, I just started to think of all the times that I've seen God interact with the Israelites, all the times that he brought victory to the Israelites, and in my mind, I just started to piece together how I was gonna approach the message this morning. My plan was I was going to start from the first time Jehovah Nisi is mentioned, find the other times that other people have referred to him as Jehovah Nisi, and then piece all those things together. But then I sat down at the computer, I started to write, and then I discovered something that I hadn't noticed before. I didn't realize that the first time Jehovah Nisi is mentioned is probably one of the only times that somebody referred to him as Jehovah Nisi. And uh, all of a sudden, my great plan is all out the window. Because I realized that if I was going to preach a message on Jehovah Nisi, then I got to stay right around the story where he was referred to by somebody as Jehovah Nisi. So with that being said, we're going to begin this morning just looking at the passage and the person who called Jehovah Nisi by that name. I'm going to start with the setting. The Israelites have been delivered from Egypt. They are now en route to the Promised Land. And while en route, the Bible says this, the Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone, put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with a sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this on a scroll as something to be remembered, and make sure that Joshua hears it, because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and called it, The Lord is my banner. He said, Because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. Uh, so we're just going to just jump right in, taking a look at the story and just seeing how it can apply to our lives today. Is it ringing out there? Yeah, sure. Just hold the mic up. Pull it up. Is that better? Ah, there we go. Because that would be just a complete waste to preach the message. Like, what did he preach on? Well, I don't know. Bells or something? So we're going to jump right in, taking a look at the story and see what we can apply to our lives this morning. Now, the first thing that I noticed was this. This attack that came from the Amalekites against the Israelites was completely unprovoked. Is it still ringing? Do you want me to use that one instead? So the first thing that I noticed that the attack against the Israelites from the Amalekites came completely unprovoked. All right, we're switching it out. Hello. Hey, there we go. I think God wants you to know that the first attack from the Amalekites against the Israelites was completely unprovoked. That's all. The altars are open. But here's the thing. The Israelites were not doing anything to bother the Amalekites. They weren't looking for a fight. They were just simply on a journey trying to get to the promised land. So the first question I have for you this morning or have for us this morning is this. Have you ever been spiritually attacked by the devil, the enemy of God who's trying to thwart God's plans and purposes for your life, 
and not just attacked, but attacked unprovoked. Meaning this, there you are on your journey just trying to get to the promised land. Now for us, it's not Canaan. For us, we know that once this life is over, there waits for us heaven, there's an eternity with God. And as you are on this journey, you don't want any trouble with anybody. You don't want any trouble with anything. But the next thing you know, the enemy just comes and attacks you. Completely unprovoked. Has that ever happened to you? If it has, then good. Not good in the sense that I wish that upon you, but good in the sense that if that has happened to you and you are here this morning, then maybe, just maybe, God has a message of encouragement for you this morning. Because this is exactly what happened to the Israelites. I remember when I was a child walking home from school one day, a bigger kid on a bike came up to me and he had a question for me. He's like, hey, are you Judy's brother? Judy's my older sister. And I said, "Uh, yes, yes I am. He's like, well, I need you to give her a message for me. It's like, okay. He gets off his bike and he starts to beat me up. Completely unprovoked. I did nothing to this guy. And I must have been around six or seven at that time. And I was like, whoa, slow down, dude. If I have to pass this message on to my sister, I'm, I'm not picking up everything. Was that one punch to the head, then a kick to the groin, and a punch to the head? Or was it two punches to the head before you kicked me in the groin? Either way, I do not think she's going to appreciate this message at all. Unprovoked attack by the enemy. And this is exactly, again, what happened to the Israelites. So we're going to go a little bit deeper. Not only did the attack come completely unprovoked, but it came at a time when the Israelites were weary and worn out from their journey. Now, you might say, well, I didn't see that in the text that you read, but the reason that we know that the condition of them, it's not speculation. The Bible gives us more insight into this encounter later on in the book of Deuteronomy when God says to Moses, remember what the Amalekites did to you along the way when you came up out of Egypt. When you were weary and worn out, they met you on your journey and attacked all who were lagging behind. They had no fear of God. So question number two. Do you feel that you experience more spiritual attacks when you're weary and when you're worn out? It's like you're getting your butt spiritually kicked when you're already down. Do you know why that is? Because the devil's a jerk. But he's also smart enough to know when the time is to strike in order to be most effective. Often he waits for an opportune time. You know, the Bible says that even when he was tempting Jesus in the wilderness, the Bible says in Luke 4, 13, when the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. There is an opportune time to face spiritual attacks, to face an onslaught from the enemy. And it often happens when you are weary and when you are worn out. Now, I can say, just full disclosure, I know that that's true for me, and Charlotte, my wife, will tell you that if I am weary or worn out, my thoughts can go to a negative place, where I can't see a good solution to problems. Sometimes I can't see paths forward. I get discouraged. I get in a bad state of mind. You might say, oh my goodness, but you're a pastor. Shouldn't you have all this under control? Before I became a pastor, I'm just Dave. And I know what it's like to face those attacks. And they come especially when I'm weary and worn out. And I know actually when I'm there. And I know sometimes, in those times, I can't just snap out of it easily. And I'm saying to myself, my thoughts are in the wrong place. But I also know this, that if I could just get some rest, tomorrow things will be better. Tomorrow I'll have a fresh perspective. Right at see whatever. But when I'm not weary, when I'm not worn out, then it seems like I can handle the attacks from the enemy a little bit better. See, the enemy's not stupid. He knows when to strike. You know, like the kid that met me after school. He knew I was weary and worn out after grade three elementary school. And there I am walking home, exhausted from my day. He didn't meet me on the way to school because morning is my prime time. But I was weary and worn out. Can anybody else relate? Have you ever faced a spiritual attack when you're already weary, when you're already worn out, and you're like, why does it happen? It seems like I'm being kicked when I'm already down. The story continues to say, the Israelites were called to fight back, but here's the thing, they're not in good shape. Meaning this, they were already weary and worn out before the attack from the Amalekites. 
And so now Moses calls them to go and fight back. But it's not going to come from a place of rest. It's not going to come from a place where they've been relaxing for a while, from a place of strength. They're going to have to face this battle from a place of extreme weakness. And so here's the moment of reality for us. There are times when God will call you to fight from a place where you do not have the strength to fight, but you'll have to enter the battle anyway. And God's not being mean. He's not being unsympathetic to us. He's actually trying to teach us a very valuable lesson. The story continues. Moses tells Joshua, I'm going to the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. The staff of God. You know, throughout the story of Moses, if you're familiar with it at all, the Bible will refer to the staff several times. This is the staff that turned into a snake. This is the staff that God told Moses, strike the Nile and it's going to turn to blood. This is the staff that God said to Moses, hold it over the ponds, causing frogs to come up onto the land of Egypt. This is the staff with, which with Moses struck the ground, causing gnats to cover the land. It was a staff with which Moses stretched out toward the sky, causing the Lord to send thunder and hail on Egypt. It was a staff with which Moses stretched out towards Egypt, bringing a scourge of locusts. And it was a staff which God said to Moses, stretch it out over the Red Sea. I'm going to part that, causing you to cross on dry ground. The staff was the one tangible thing that Moses had in his possession that God said right from the beginning of Moses' call that he would use this to perform signs and wonders. You know, when God was giving Moses his assignment, and his assignment was absolutely huge, Moses had some questions understandably. And this is what the Bible says. Moses answered, what if they don't believe me? What if they don't listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, throw it onto the ground. Moses threw it on the ground, and it became a snake, and he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake, and it turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. There was just something so significant about this staff that Moses had. It became basically his symbol of dependency on God. Now, please do not misunderstand. Moses would have known it had nothing to do with the staff itself. The staff is not a magic wand. That's not the purpose of this staff. But it was God who decided to do something significant through it. And you see it all the time where God says, do this with the staff, hit this, raise this, split this. It was a sign of Moses' dependency on God. So that Moses says to Joshua, while you are getting ready to fight, myself and Aaron and her, we're going to be going up to the top of the hill And I have the staff of God in my hands. And you know what happens when I raise the staff? It's a symbol of our dependency on God. And we've seen God come through time and time again with miracle upon miracle. So that's where I'll be, right up there with this. The Bible says Joshua goes to fight the Amalekites and Moses goes up onto the hill. So they enter the battle. And here's the thing as it applies to us all. There are times when you are weary when you are worn out, and God will cause you to enter the battle anyway. But always remember this, and Pastor Jamie referred to it, you are not alone. We are not alone. They were part of an army. They could look up and see their leaders, Moses, Aaron, and her on the top of the hill with a staff raised towards heaven. They knew what that meant. It was a sign of their dependency on God. Last week, Pastor Jamie presented an opportunity for you to fill out these prayer cards, and there was a tremendous response. And throughout this week, we have been taking your request. We have interceded on your behalf. You might be weary. You might be worn out, but you are not alone. You are part of something much greater. Now, the story goes on to say that as long as Moses held his hands up, the Israelites were winning. When he dropped his hands, the Amalekites were winning. To use a sports analogy, this is what's known as a momentum shift. How many of you have ever watched a sporting event and you've seen a momentum shift in the game? You know, a great example happened of, I see that hand. A great example happened just last Sunday. 
you know, after church last Sunday, I stopped by Sobeys to get some ingredients for our supper, and I ran into my friend, Greg Terryberry, and we started to talk about football, which admittedly, I do not know a whole lot about. Now, I have always watched the Super Bowl, but I don't follow any particular team throughout the regular season, but I enjoy the Super Bowl, so I've always watched the Super Bowl ever since I was a little kid. And so sometimes I will watch the game just before that, the conference championships, because I want to at least know who's going to be playing and at least be somewhat familiar with the teams that are entering into the big game. So Greg was talking about the teams that were going to be playing that afternoon, so I decided to watch it. The Kansas City Chiefs versus the Houston Texans. Anybody see this game last week? <laughs> yeah. Well, let me explain what happened. So they're playing in Kansas City. The Texans came out of the gates strong. They were putting up points, points all unanswered. Soon it was 24 nothing for the Texans. I sent Greg a message on Facebook at 344, simply saying, watching the game, followed by this emoji. Because I know that he was rooting for KC. He was like, yee, they're getting their butts kicked. But then there was a momentum shift. Kansas City started coming back. And you could see things moving in their favor. Houston started to make all kinds of mistakes. Kansas City was tightening up their game. And Kansas City, after being down 24-0, ended up winning the game 51-31. Momentum shift. So here we have Moses. When his hands are raised, the Israelites are winning. When his hands drop, the Amalekites start winning. And so I can almost read it this way as I kind of see what the staff represents. It's almost like when his hands were raised, indicating their dependence on God, that as long as that dependence was on display, victory was assured. But when they dropped, when he dropped his hands, it was almost as if to say they're going to just rely on human effort. It's like Moses, like, I, I, I'm tired. I can't keep these hands up anymore. And so, therefore, the results of the battle are just going to have to depend on how well the Israelites fight. But as soon as that, those hands were dropped, the Amalekites started winning. And defeat is pretty much assured. So Moses gets tired. He can't keep his hands up any longer, even though he knows that it is the right thing to do. Another question for you. Have you ever gotten tired depending on God? Has anyone ever gotten tired depending on God? You've shown that your dependence is on God. You've been gaining some ground, but then you look and you see that the battle is nowhere near done. And now you're getting tired. You're just getting so tired of the fight that you just can't keep doing what you've been doing any longer. Mentally, you know that depending on God is the right thing to do. But you just can't. You're so tired. You've been doing it for so long. And so therefore, you resign yourself to the mindset of, well, whatever happens will happen. But you know that as long as you have that mindset, you're ultimately going to lose this fight. When Aaron and Hur saw that Moses could not do it on his own anymore, they immediately came to Moses' aid, saying, we will help hold the hands. We will assist in the dependence on God. We know that there is no way that we could win this battle by human effort. We need God and Moses, if you're too weak to go on, we're going to come alongside and offer our support. This is the benefit of being part of a team. This should be the benefit of being part of a church. That when you can't go on anymore, when you are weak and weary from the fight, that there should be others to come alongside to reinforce your dependence on God. And again, this is what is happening with the prayer cards. This is why when the altars are open and people are invited to come up, sometimes it's just that. You are so weak. You are so weary from the fight. And it happens to everybody. But don't walk out the same way you came in. Come on up to the front because there's going to be people, there will be people who will come alongside to reinforce your dependence on God. You are not alone in this at all. The Bible says that when Aaron and Hur came alongside, when Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone, put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady until sunset. And the result is this. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. His hands remained steady. There's no more shakiness. 
There is no more instability. Moses is not alone. He has support on both sides, and now his hands are steady. You know, it's kind of like what the Bible says when referring to the power of three. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 4.12, the one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. And so now with that dependency on God firmly in place, the Bible says Joshua overcame the army. And then it continues to say this. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and called it, The Lord is my banner. He said, Because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. So Moses builds an altar and calls it, The Lord is my banner. Jehovah Nisi. So back to some of the earlier questions. Why would God call the Israelites into a fight when they are so weak and weary already from their journey. When Moses is too tired to keep his hands up for any great amount of time. And then after they are victorious, why would Moses reveal that name to us? That he would say, this is my takeaway. The Lord is my banner. And one of the only times that somebody referred to the Lord that way. Now God reveals himself that way in some of the other scriptures, but this is the one time where Somebody reveals to the Lord in this sense, the Lord is my banner. What does that even mean, to have the Lord be your banner? Well, here's the thing about a banner or a flag or a pennant or even a jersey. A banner reminds you of whose team you are on. You know, it's like if you go see a Maple Leaf game, you will see a sea of blue in the stands. They're supporting their team. And not to isolate the congregation here, if you go to Montreal, or you don't even have to go to Montreal, but if you're a Canadians fan, you will see the same thing. It will be a sea of red supporting their team. Ah, all right, fine, Oilers. I don't watch hockey either. I know I'm a horrible Canadian. Whatever team you are supporting, whatever color of jersey you are sporting, you are saying, that is my team. Now, in a much greater sense, as far as a spiritual battle is concerned, when you are facing whatever spiritual battle you are facing, remember whose team you are on. The Lord is your banner. You are on Team Jehovah Nisi. The Lord is my banner. Now, there is a different story involving Joshua that I always find rather interesting. The Bible says in Joshua 5, and this is just before Joshua goes and does his famous march around Jericho. But the Bible says this, Now, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. So here Joshua is asking the commander of the Lord's army, Whose team are you on? Are you on our team? Or are you on the team of our enemy? And I love the response from the commander of the army of the Lord. He says, Neither. This is not a question of me being on your team or, you, or me being on the team of the enemy. I am the commander of the Lord's army. Therefore, you are on my team. And it might seem like just semantics, but that's, that's the difference maker right there. If, the Jehovah, if Jehovah is our banner, then we need to remember that we are on his team. And he never loses. He is the Lord. And that alone sometimes is enough to help us in the fight. And so why does God call us to fight at times when we are worn? Why does he call us at times to fight when we are weary? Because it's simply to remind us that the victory is not going to be coming because of our strength anyway. It's not about how strong we are. It's not about how weak we are. It's not about how ill-equipped we are. It doesn't matter how well-equipped we are. The victory comes because he is Jehovah. He is the captain of the team. And we are on his team. I mean, consider another well-known battle. 
And look at what God says during the preparation for this battle. God calls a guy by the name of Gideon to go into battle against the Midianites, an army whom the Bible says could not be counted. There were so many Midianites. Gideon, who has absolutely zero leadership experience, has to lead 32,000 men into this battle. But before he does, God says this to Gideon. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands, or Israel would boast against me. My own strength has saved me. Now announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left, while 10,000 remained. So you can kind of get an understanding of the opposition and how fearful these guys were. Even though they had an army of 32,000, God said, the odds are still stacked against you. But there is a chance that you might be victorious. And if you are victorious with 32,000, we run the risk of you taking credit for the victory. And that can't happen. So I got to whittle these numbers down. Anybody who's afraid, you can just go home. 22,000 guys like, whoo, thank you, we're gone. 10,000 remain. And that was still too many. God still had it whittled down to 300 before finally God said to Gideon, now you can enter the battle. And so therefore, in the same way, why does God call us to the battle when we are worn, weary, when the odds are stacked against us? Because again, God is just trying to remind us that victory is not going to come through us anyway. It's going to come through him. It doesn't matter how strong or weak we are. It doesn't matter how weary or refreshed we are. It doesn't matter if we have a full army or a small remnant. Our victory does not come through us. It comes through him. Jehovah Nisi. The Lord is my banner. Now, just to bring some balance, because I know sometimes... People can just take something and then go to an extreme. It's like, so what are you saying, Pastor Dave, that we always have to be worn, we always have to be weary before God comes through for us? No, it's not about that. It's about our dependency on God. Consider this example, a different yet well-known battle, David and Goliath. Here you have the Philistine army challenging the Israelites, and it's a standoff. And Goliath says to the Israelites, this is the challenge from the enemy of Israel. Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. And then watch the reaction of the Israelites. Then the Philistines said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Why? Because right now they are operating under the banner of King Saul. And they're terrified. Because when the giant comes and shouts his defiance, all of them go running. And King Saul is right there with them. And it's the enemy that says, aren't you the armies of Saul? And so then they look at Saul, and Saul is just as afraid as the rest of them. That can be incredibly discouraging. That is until a young guy comes from the shepherd's field. He's relaxed. He's refreshed. He's not even going there to fight in the battle. He's just going there to check on his brothers and give them some cheese. And while he is there, the giant comes out and shouts his defiances. But David's reaction is so different than the Israelites and King Saul. Later on, David would say, as he's talking with the armies and his brothers, he's like, Wait, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? In other words, what David is saying, we are not Team Saul. Have you forgotten whose team we are on? He is defying the armies of the living God. If you guys are too afraid to go face this guy, I'll go. Now, when David said that, he received all kinds of opposition from his brothers and also from King Saul. They said, David, you cannot go. You do not know what you're dealing with here. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, 
I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. And basically what David is saying, it, it's not about me. This is all about God. The Lord who rescued me from the lion and the bear, he's the one that's also going to rescue us from this Philistine. This is God's battle. Have you forgotten whose team we are on? And then Saul was like, well, David, if you're going to go at least put my armor on. And so David puts on the armor of Saul and he kind of walks around, he's clunking around. And eventually David says, I cannot go in these because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream and put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag. And with a sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. It's like, Saul, you're still not getting it. If we are going to be victorious, victory is only going to come because we are the armies of the living God. It's not going to be about protecting myself in the natural with your armor. It's not about my ability to use a sword. It's not about me having a shield and deflecting whatever it is that the enemy is going to throw at me. Victory is only going to be coming because we are operating under the banner of Jehovah Nisi. And I love what the Bible says in 1 Samuel 17, 48. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. He was not weary. He was not worn. He's like, I'm ready. Bring it on. I don't need armor. All I need is like a like slingshot, five stones, and I'm just going to throw one stone, and God's going to direct it because this is all about God. It has nothing to do with my ability. We are going to be successful because of Jehovah Nisi. And so, therefore, as far as we are concerned in here this morning, we are not team Faith Welland. We are not team Pastor Jamie. We are not team pastoral staff. We are not team W-O-D-P-A-O-C. We're not even team P-A-O-C. Because if our success depended on any of these things, we are going to get discouraged because it's all human efforts. I thank God for the support that comes from all of those things that I have mentioned. But our victory is going to depend on the fact that we are Jehovah Nisi. The Lord is our banner. And so even though there's lots of needs that are represented here, and Pastor Jamie is absolutely right. When you read the, the, the needs, they are absolutely overwhelming. And so when I'm looking at them, I'm thinking, thank God this does not depend on me. Thank God this does not depend on human effort. But we can bring these needs before Jehovah Nisi and say, Lord, this is under your authority. And now as commander of the Lord's army, we hand this over to you. And he is more than able. Our victory comes as we remind ourselves of the fact that the Lord is our banner. I'm just going to ask if the worship team would come back. I have one final thought, and hopefully this will be of encouragement to somebody. After Joshua won the battle, the Bible says this, Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this on a scroll as something to be remembered, and make sure that Joshua hears it, because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and called it, The Lord is my banner. He said, Because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. The promise from the Lord was to completely wipe out the Amalekites. And even though that was the promise, neither Joshua nor Moses would see that promise fulfilled. The point is this, you might be believing God for something, and you are getting discouraged because it seems like, I mean, God is not coming through at all. But here's the thing. This initial battle against the Amalekites, it took place around 1446 B.C. And now we fast forward 418 years to 1028 B.C., where we find ourselves in 1 Samuel chapter 15. And God speaks to a man by the name of Saul. And he says to him through Samuel, 
Samuel said to Saul, I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. Now go, attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men, women, children, infants, cattle, sheep, camels, and donkeys. What is the point of that? Because here we are 418 years after God issued that initial promise. Joshua's not around anymore. Moses is not around anymore. But God is still true to his word. And he still keeps his promise. Even though Joshua and Moses would not be alive to see it. And the encouragement thing for us this morning is the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 7 that we live by faith and not by sight. And just because we do not see the victory immediately does not mean that victory is not assured. When you are under Jehovah Nisi, victory is always assured. And it's hard for us sometimes to grasp in the society that we live in because we want results immediately. We live in a very now society, but it doesn't always work that way. You know, the Bible even says in Hebrews chapter 11, and it's often referred to as the faith chapter because it acknowledges some of the heroes of the faith. But in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 39, the Bible says, referring to these giants of the faith, they were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. Since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. So what is the encouragement in that? When it comes to the battle, I do not have all the answers for you, but I do know this, that we are part of Jehovah Nisi. And there's some things that God has promised to you and you're waiting to see it happen, but even if you do not see it happen in your lifetime, do not doubt who Jehovah Nisi is. For those of you that have heard me preach before, you've heard about the faith of my grandmother and my great-grandmother. I did have the privilege of meeting my great-grandmother, but by the time I met her, she was so far gone into the advanced stages of Alzheimer's that she did not know who I was. But I do know this. I know that she prayed for us. I know that she prayed for us. And even though she did not see the fruit of her prayers, I know that I can stand here and say that I am here today because of the prayers of my grandmother, my great-grandmother. And some of you that are believing God for your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren, and you want to see it in your lifetime, and there's nothing wrong with wanting to see it in your lifetime. But know this, God is a God who keeps his word. And even though you may not see it, do not doubt who Jehovah Nisi is, because God never loses. He is Jehovah Nisi. He is the victory banner. If God had a gym, around his gym would hang all first place pennants. You know, on Thursdays we play volleyball at one of the, the local schools here and you see pennants for finalists and consolation winner and third place and all these other things. And you kind of look and say, wow, they are so proud of their accomplishments. But if God had a gym, First place, first place, first place, first place, first place, first place. He never loses. He never loses. We are on Team Nisi. Jehovah, our banner. Can we stand as we close our time in prayer? Before the worship team sings the song again, that is around Psalm 23, which declares the fact that our victory is in Him. Before they do that, I just want to issue, it's not even a challenge, it's more just to ask a question. If you are here this morning and you find yourself so weak, so weary from the battle, you are in the right place and you are not alone. When the worship team begins to play, if that is you and you want somebody to come along and stand beside you, to reinforce your dependence on God, this is what a church should be doing. And so if you're here again and as they begin to play, don't be embarrassed because we've all been through those places where we're like, God, I am so tired of depending on you. I am so tired of trying to do this in my own strength. Do not do it in your own strength any longer. Just come, allow us to come along beside you. One on the left, one on the right and encourage your dependency on God. You are not alone. Do not leave here carrying the same burden that you came in with. I'm just going to ask if you would bow your heads and close your eyes. 
You know, if you find yourself here this morning, you say, you know what, Pastor Dave, it feels like you were talking to me this morning. Or I just feel so weary from that fight. If that's you this morning, would you just raise your hand? Or you just feel, yes, I see that. Yes. Anyone else? Yes. 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 Just in this atmosphere where God is here in this place, and as the worship team leads you into the presence of God, we're just going to encourage you to make your way from your pew and just come up to the altar where we can stand alongside you. Your victory is because of who he is. He is Jehovah Nisi. He is your banner. Father, I thank you for this time that we have to come into your presence. Lord, I thank you for this church. I thank you, Lord, for this family. I thank you, Lord, that your word reminds us that when one part of the body hurts, we all hurt. When one part of the body rejoices, we all rejoice. And so, Father, even now, as we take a few more minutes just to enter into your presence, God, I pray specifically for those this morning that are so weak and so weary from the fight, and they look down and the battle is raging and they just can't go on any longer, and they know that if they don't depend on you, that they're probably going to be defeated, but they just are so tired. God, I pray that even now you would encourage those people, that, Lord, you would just once again bring faith and hope Lord, you are the lifter of our heads. And Father, in this place, we are family. And so, Father, I just pray that ministry would take place in these next few minutes as we just once again reinforce our dependence on you. That, Lord, we will not obtain victory by our own human efforts, but when we acknowledge that we are on your team and you are Jehovah Nisi, our banner, the Lord, victory is always assured. And Lord, we give you all of this and we lay these requests before you, knowing that you're able to do even more than we ask, even more than we could possibly imagine. In Jesus' name, amen. Just now as the worship team begins to play, if that's you here this morning, just please come forward so we can come alongside you. The Lord is my shepherd. He goes before Also, if you see people here at the altar, then please come along and just stand beside them. Just put a hand on their shoulder just so that they know they are not alone. It's an open invitation not only for those to come and receive prayer, but also for those to come alongside, just as Aaron and her did, just to be that support. Joshua won the battle. The Lord then said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. 
Moses built an altar and called it, The Lord is my banner. Last week, Pastor Jamie issued the invitation that if you have a need here, whatever it is, just to write it on your prayer request card and drop it here at the front. This morning, as we wrap up our service, there's going to be something different. Here, God said to Moses, after the victory had taken place, he said, write this on a scroll and tell Joshua. So what we would like for you to do this time you know, sometimes we believe God for victories and when God comes through with a victory, we get all of excited about it and then we move on to the next problem. But write down what God has done for you. Write down the victory and then make it a point this week to tell somebody, let me tell you what God did for me this week. You know, and sometimes when we do that, it just is a faith builder for whatever it is that is coming next because guaranteed there is something that is coming next. And I don't speak that over you. It's just life. It's full of mountains and valleys. Mountains will not always remain mountains, but valleys will not always remain valleys. But as we see God become victorious for us, we can just say, you know what, God, I just want to acknowledge that, that you came through in this area. So I'm going to write that down so I don't forget. Because how many times did God say to the Israelites, you forget what I did for you when you're in Egypt? You forget all the miracles. You forget all of these things. And then therefore you get so discouraged. Just remember the things that I have done for you. And what a great way to help us remember than just taking a piece of paper like we did last week and just write it down and then tell somebody. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much that you are Jehovah Nisi. You are our banner. And God, I thank you so much that those that might find themselves in the middle of the fight right now, Lord, we just declare our dependency on you. Because, Lord, you never lose. You work all things together for good. And so, Father, I pray for faith, faith to be strengthened. I pray for hope to be renewed. I ask, oh God, that every lie of the enemy would be broken and that we would just know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are in control of everything. You have not forgotten us. Your arm is not too short to save. It's not that you are not being sympathetic with us, but Lord, we, were, we are brought to these places at times to be reminded of the fact that our victory will be because of who you are. And Lord, we give you all the honor and glory and praise that is due your name. And whatever needs are represented here at this altar, whatever needs came forward in person, Lord, we know that you are more than able to not only meet all of the needs, but you're able to do even more than we ask, even more than we could possibly imagine. Father, I pray that as we go from this place, we would go encouraged, reminded of the fact that we are on your team and you never lose. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless.